Hello and thank you for joining this OncLive TV Peer Exchange. This program features expert panel discussions highlighting current options for second line and later line treatment in unresectable metastatic colorectal cancer with a particular focus on clinical case study reports. My name is Dr. John Marshall and I am director of the Roosh Center for the Cure of GI Cancers and Chief of Hematology and Oncology, Lombardi Comprehensive Cancer Center, Georgetown University Medical Center. Participating today on our distinguished panel are Dr. Johanna Bendel, Director, GI Oncology Research and Associate Director, Drug Development Unit, Sarah Cannon Research Institute, Tennessee Oncology. Dr. Maran Fucky, Professor, Medical Oncology and Therapeutics Research and Director of GI Medical Oncology, City of Hope Comprehensive Cancer Center. Dr. Heinz Joseph Lenz, Professor of Medicine and Preventive Medicine, Section Head of GI Oncology in the Division of Medical Oncology, and Co-Director of the Colorectal Cancer Center, USC Keck School of Medicine, Division of Medical Oncology. And finally, last but not least, Dr. Alan Vanuk, Madden Family Distinguished Professor of Medical Oncology and Translational Research, and Professor of Clinical Medicine, Division of Medical Oncology, University of California, San Francisco. Alan. Thanks, John. And thank you guys very much. I couldn't be surrounded by a stronger group of folks um, really to meet together, give us an update on where we are in the management of metastatic colorectal cancer, um, and really kind of drill down for our audience of how best to take this data in managing our patients. We'll also, of course, cover some of the new innovations that are coming forward, uh, both new medicines but new approaches. And I really think the first place for us to start is really the biggest story, and that is this KRAS testing. And I, you know, we, we've gone through the EGFR story where at the beginning it was receptors, and then that wasn't right, and then it became KRAS testing, and that helped, and agents got better and things improved. Um, but newer evidence from PRIME study, we're going to talk about that, the FIRE 3 study, we're going to talk about that, um, has suggested that we still don't have this quite right, that we can figure out better who should get these medicines and who shouldn't get these medicines. And, you know, even among us, there's confusion about what is the right thing to be doing, what should we be doing today, how do we get it done, how does it influence us. So we know about codon 12 and 13. But maybe, Marlon, you can kind of start and say, today in the United States, or maybe December of last year in the United States, what was the current standard for managing patients uh, around KRAS testing? Sure. I mean, the, the, until recently, the, the management is really guided by KRAS uh, exon uh, uh, 2 mutations and looking at codon 12 and 13 mutations. So it's basically seven mutations that guide our selection of anti-EGFR therapy. So, so I just want to make sure, because I got a little confused when I said, so exon 2, tw we all know about 12 and 13, but they're in this exon 2 section, right? That's correct. Okay. So uh, until recently, we have not been looking at exon 3 and 4, and we have been selecting our treatment based on exon 2 mutations. And uh, uh, obviously, the landscape is changing, and, and I think that's good for our patients. Yeah. So, Heinz, I, we're sort of going to pick on you to explain to all of us what's going on here, and, what, and we'll talk maybe more openly about, well, what should we be doing today? So what's the science here? So I think this is actually an exciting time. I think we are battling the understanding of the pathways much better. At the same time, we see a development of incredible technology detecting uh, mutations at a very, very sensitive level. From the pathway, it's actually all clear. When we looked in, in the beginning in this pathway, it was KVAS and NVAS and BVAF, it's already there. For some reason, we thought that only exon 2 mutation in KVAS would be predictive of resistance. The others were really not tested. But when they have the same functional impact, they should be also clinically significant. So only because of the peak um, and prime clinical data analysis expanding the VAS testing in the additional exons for KVAS 3 and 4, and including NVAS 2 and 3, we suddenly see there are mutations. And actually, there are significant numbers of. In the previous thought, wild type exon 2 patient population, we find 15 to 20% additional mutation. And I think the clinical data we have seen 
in all these clinical trials, doesn't matter if it's the tuximab or panitumumab, that these act like the mutations we are used to test. So I think we will be in a better position to select patients who have more benefit and the patients who don't. Now, I think where confusion comes in is, you know, how do we implement this test? Uh, what technologies do we use? Because the standard technologies, we can pick up probably 10 out of 100 cells or 20 out of 100 cells. Technologies now become available um, are now detecting one out of 10,000. Now, the big clinical question is, is that the same clinically meaningful mutation data or not? Does a patient who has one out of 10,000 have the same predictive value than the one with you have five or 10 or 20? I think there are a lot of questions to it. I think from the scientific part, there are significant advances understanding potentially the role because what one of the new buzzwords coming out is functional heterogeneity. So when you find one mutation, does not mean that is not meaningful for a really bunch of environmental cancer cells around it. So I think I'm very excited. I think we need to be just very clear in order to implement that in our daily practices. And there is a disconnect what science can do and how we should react in the clinical practice. So do I really care? Why don't I just try this medicine? If you can't even tell me whether the mutation <laughs> matters or not, right? You made a lot of uh, talk about this, but why don't I just throw the drug, Johanna? Why don't I just try the drug in these patients? Any harm here? Yeah, and so this is, this is where it comes down to. When I first heard this data, I said, what am I going to say to my physicians in the community who mm -hmm. are treating all different types of cancers. How do I make it simple to let them know what to do? And the way that I looked at it is I said, you know what, guys? We know what KRAS mutations are. Now we're finding more people have different ways to mutate a KRAS, including NRAS. And what we need to do is we need to do expanded testing to define who is and who isn't a KRAS mutation patient. And so right now, what I would take home for this, what I would take home from this in terms of how do you practically implement it is that in my, in my practice, what I've been encouraging physicians to do within our centers is to go ahead and do and order the expanded KRAS testing. Right now, we're not sure how functional tumor heterogeneity comes into play, but I think what we do know is that from the data that we've seen, there's a suggestion that if you treat those patients with KRAS mutation, especially with the expanded KRAS mutation, you could actually do harm to them by treating them with an anti-EGFR inhibitor. And that's why I really sort of pushed on our docs to try to get that testing done, because the last thing that you want to do is have somebody come back with that KRAS mutation and potentially harm their survival. Let's say I'm on week three of cetuximab, okay? And I'm just hearing about this right now. And all I've got is codon 12 and 13 in the bank. I don't know about any other mutation. Do I stop that patient and wait and retest? What do you think? That's one of the hardest questions. <laughs> it is one of the hardest questions. But I will tell you, as Heinz suggested, it's about 20% more patients that are going to have those additional mutations. And so depending, now you, you have to look at the clinical scenario, depending on where you're using it, what you're using it with, do you have a treatment you can keep them on while you hold the cetuximab? I probably would say go ahead and test Yeah, it. I think you should. Test it. Yeah, particularly when you, you look at, patient, absolutely, right? yeah. because when you look at the data, particularly when you combine an EGF receptor inhibitor with Folfox, these patients are actually harmed. So I think you are obligated to make sure the biggest efforts to get this test done. I think one of the challenges right now in the community is, do we have tests available where we can send the samples? Because uh, in Europe, it's already mandated. You cannot give an EGF receptor antibody at all if the expanded VAS testing is not done. It will come here too. I think the, the maybe the uh, different organization of Laboratory testing in different countries makes it sometimes more easier or more difficult. We have a lot of laboratories who, who are starting to offer that, so I think we should implement as soon as possible. Yeah, so they're sort of the European Union quick embracers of this, even though they don't have a very clear test and way to, to measure that, right? But because of the harm. Yeah. You know, I think the, the, safe than it was driven by not harming patients, not by the efficacy, but harming. And I but think we that's in the U.S. are sort of entrepreneurial, and, and so we'll risk the harm. We have more diversity, I think, <laughs> and that I think is the challenge. But Alan yeah. mentioned because yeah. what do we do? When because when you get a test, 
We don't know the mutation fraction. So I think be complicated because we have patients coming from foundation medicine to very quest laboratories where you just have two uh, mutation tested. So I think we have a lot of uh, spectrum of different possibilities, but I think we need to do the right thing for our patients. Yeah. So, um, Alan, let me.